We're going to uh, continue what we've been talking about. This will be the last one of this series, so to speak. We've been talking about grace. We've been talking about the favor of our God, unmerited favor. And we see here, last week we were talking, remember we went to Deuteronomy 6? Hear, O Israel, right? The Lord, and looking at how the Lord, over and over again, what did he say to them? Do not, come on, do not forget. Because what happens? We forget. Did Israel forget the favor, the grace that God had extended to them? Yeah, they did. Guess what, guys? Have we forgotten sometimes the grace that God has extended to us? Yeah, we can very easily, can't we? And Paul was very concerned about this, or the writer of Hebrews was concerned about this. We went through Hebrews 10, halfway through last week, and we're going to pick it up there. And we'll just read the end. He's worried about them taking the grace of God and using it for something it's not intended to be. Okay? He talks about the law of Moses, and he talks about under two or three witnesses, right? This is where judgment came. And he says, how much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who is trampled under the foot of the son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace thank you Jim the spirit of grace for we know him who said vengeance is mine and I will repay and again the Lord will judge his people it is a terrifying things to fall into the hand of the living God all right are these strong verses Paul wasn't missing, or the writer of Hebrews wasn't missing words here, was he? He wasn't saying, guys, it's okay. It's no big deal. You know what? If you want to go out and just trample under the foot of, you know, the cross and just kind of say, you know what, grace covers all and continuing sinning, it's not that big of a deal. And do you know that's the message we hear now in the church? It's not that big of a deal, guys. But the reality is, is the writer saying it's a very big deal? Is he saying it's a terrifying thing, actually? That if we take what Christ has done for us, the context of 10 is therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, what do we do? We draw near through the sacrifice of Jesus. And then if we say, you know what? The sacrifice of Jesus has given me the entitlement to sin and do whatever I want. He says fear. He says that's absolutely terrifying because then you're taking what God has done for us and turning it in what we say a license to sin. And he says, if we then do that, what will we do? We will insult the spirit of grace. We will insult the God who has given us that grace. And he says, vengeance is mine, right? So then he continues on. All right, we could end there. And obviously that's a hard verse and we need to let that get in us. But then he continues his train of thought. And he says, remember the former days. Everyone say former days. What are former days? Days past. And you might say, you know what? Well, maybe I grew up in a cr good Christian home, so I didn't have the bad former days. Guys, we've all had bad former days. Okay, I grew up from a young age in a Christian home, and guess what? I had some former days. Do you have some former days? Okay. Is Paul or the writer of Hebrews telling us to remember them? Right? We have this verse that we use, guys, in the church, and it's actually out of context. And we all quote uh, Philippians, and what do we say? Well, I forget what lies behind, and I move on to what lies ahead. Do you know that verse is actually about the rapture, the upward call? It's looking up because I know my redemption is drawing near. It's not about forgetting your past, guys. Do you know you're actually supposed to remember where you've come from? Because it actually keeps you in a place of grace. Remembering the favor, remembering, man, I was a wretched sinner, and I did horrible things, but Christ Jesus rescued me. He delivered me. Now, I'm not saying dwell in that place and let shame and condemnation and woe. No, none of that. But to remember where we've come from, just as the writer says, for remember the former days while you were being enlightened, while you were coming to the knowledge of the truth, right? You endured great conflict of suffering, partially by being made a public spectacle through approaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. Think about what the writer just said there for a moment, okay? He says, you endured great conflict, right? Being made public spectacles, okay, through approach, tribulation, partly becoming sharers with those who were so treated. Then he says, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession, a lasting one. No, no, no. Wait, he just said, what? Dwell on that for a moment. 
Right now, if the Irish government came in and took all our properties away, how would you feel? <laughs> would you start another rebellion? <laughs> you might. <laughs> We're Irish, yeah. Well, what's the point of this statement? We wouldn't feel good. Did Paul say that they felt good all the time, but did he say they joyfully experienced it? Why? Where was their focus? Heavenward, absolutely, on the grace. Guys, I want to tell you right now, in the Western world, we are entitled. Do you know this, guys? All of us are. Don't touch my stuff. I'm having a bad day. Oh, everything's wrong. Leave me alone, myself included. And guess what? I'm going to tell you and myself, get over yourself. Get over myself, Kyle. Because the reality is, if we really believe the Bible... And especially, Mike's going to come and talk about biblical prophecy. If we really believe Jesus is coming back soon, and we see all the stuff happening in the world, what did he say it would be like at the end of the age? He said it would be easy for the Christian. He said everything would go grand, great, and wonderful, and everyone would love you. The opposite. And if we can't share with one another our blessings that God has given us, well, then how are we going to endure this world? If we can't care for even the household of God, how will we then be when the day comes and the reality is you think well I'll get through it well I'm going to tell you guys by and large you know what's going to happen to a lot of people in those stages they're going to go along to get along they're actually going to compromise they're going to uh-huh the scriptures are very clear at the end of the age these are hard things but it's the truth there will be a great apostasy a great falling away and if we don't allow this stuff to get into us now when the testing comes could we be in some trouble doesn't mean we won't rise up. Doesn't mean faith won't come up in us and Christ will work in us. But could we have some trouble, let's say? So this is why Paul, what is he reminding them of? Don't forget. Don't forget. I bet you there's things, if we're all honest with ourselves, in our zeal when we first came to Christ, when somebody did something to us, we went, thank you, Jesus. And then if someone did it to us now after being in Christ for 20 years, we go, how dare they? I bet you it's true. Because our zeal has waned a little bit. And it can happen, guys. And we have to be honest in that. Yeah, an offense can come in. We talked about that last week. Again, if you missed a week, we put all our teachings on YouTube for a reason. We think it's a great evangelistic tool while we have it. We also think it's a great way for all of us to catch up on teaching. And also, we have our two other churches in New York and in Houston all on YouTube. So then we can have good teaching. We can be connected with one another. So if you want more teaching, go there. Or you missed a teaching, you can go on YouTube, Banner of Love Ministries. That's it. So the joyful seizure of your property. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. All right? We're still in chapter 10. So what was the context of the confidence? Therefore, since we have confidence to what? Draw near to who? Yeah, to Jesus. Right? We have bold and confident access through Christ Jesus. So what are we supposed to always remember, guys? The grace we have been given through Christ Jesus, that now we have bold and confident access to come anytime we want. Amen. The high priest, guys, the context of this is the Day of Atonement. They could only go in once a year because of sinful man, not because of God. God desired a greater level of intimacy, and he had a perfect plan through Christ Jesus. And then through Christ Jesus, what happened? We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And we are reconciled to the Father. So every day, can I come in boldly through Jesus and come to my God? Can I boldly step into that place of intimacy with him and come near to his throne of grace like we've read before? He says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. This is the word for the day, I think. We have need of endurance, guys. We get knocked down. Things happen. Life is hard. We have trial. We have tribulation. And did they have trial and tribulation? And what is the writer reminding them? We need endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was, pro what was promised. Excuse me. For yet, in a very little while, what's a very little while? A short time. Okay. All right, we look at time and we think, come on, guys, we think like it's taking forever. <laughs> we exaggerate, don't we? But do you know our lives are just blips? The Lord says 70 years, doesn't he? That's a generation, 70 years. And if we go on beyond that, are we blessed? Mm -hmm, thank you, Lord. Okay, and can he sustain us? And if we honor the commands, does it not say he'll give us long life? 
There's actually blessing in that, okay? So we walk in his commands and we will live longer. And while we're in this body, does he have a plan and a purpose for us? Absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. But in a little while means in a little while, a little while excuse me, guys, that we look at it and we can, oh, it's taking forever. Or the, the unfortunate thing when it comes to the coming of Jesus, the church comes along when they say, oh, nobody knows the day or the hour, right? Come to Bible school and we'll have some good teaching on that. But the point is, That he says, in a little while, he who is coming will come. Who's coming? Who's coming? Come on, church. Jesus. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Okay. He is coming and will not delay. All right. Joan said it. She's in Sunday school. She said it during uh, communion. Did she read about the first time that Jesus came at the appointed time? Right? That Jesus came. So the second time, is there an appointed day? Is there a fixed time when the Father will say, go? It's time for you to take your inheritance. It's time for my saints, my sanctified ones, to join us in the kingdom. That's us, guys, if we hold fast firm until the end. But then the Lord says, but my righteous one shall live by? All right. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Joan had no clue what I was sharing about. And then God is funny like that. Did you notice in her thing she had a lot on faith? So guess what we're going to talk about? God's grace does not empower us to do nothing. Okay. The gospel is always about giving, sorry, getting, excuse me, receiving, and then giving. Freely you have received, freely give, give, okay? This is always the context of the gospel message. Not works. We're not saved by works. Don't worry, we're going to James, okay? And it says here, by righteous, uh, my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back. Can we get an amen there? I hope that's you. I only heard a couple amens there. We are not those who shrink back. Amen. That was still really bad. (laughs) Guys, that should have been allowed. Everyone says amen. Because if you can't say amen there, there's a problem. Ready? We're going to do it one more time. We are not those who shrink back. Amen. Amen. All right. If you don't want to say amen, there's a problem. Because that means you think you can shrink back. That should be allowed. We agree. So be it, Lord. We need to proclaim that I am not shrinking back. Even if none go with me, Lord, still I will follow. That needs to be our heart. Anyway, continuing on. My soul has no pleasure in, but we are not those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to persevering of the soul. So we persevere. The Lord gives us endurance. Paul said we're on a race, didn't he? He said we're in a fight. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord dwelling within us, we've received a greater grace, and we have power to keep on going. And as we keep going, we say, Lord, I am not going to shrink back, but I am the one who what perseveres and keeps fighting the good fight, and I will obtain my inheritance. So the important part here, guys, is over and over again through scriptures, don't forget. Don't forget what Christ has done for you. Don't make That thing over there in the corner, we have a cross. Don't make that commonplace. Don't make that something you say, oh, yeah, Jesus paid. Isn't it kind of sad, right? In the Christian church, we reduce to the cross. We just say, oh, yeah, Jesus paid the sins on the cross, and I've been forgiven. Is that true? It is true. But is there a lot more? Is that the dumbing it down to the, the minute detail of it? That cross means so much to anybody who is of the faith. And we need to stay in that place and remind ourselves and not forget what Christ has done for us. All right, so here's the, but wait, there's more. Has anyone ever seen an infomercial or you listen on the radio and they go, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and they're usually trying to sell you some rubbish product that you don't need. And they're trying to, you know, pull a fast one on you. What was in America, they used to sell snake oil. Do You guys ever hear that snake oil salesman? There's no such thing as snake oil. <laughs> okay. But in the kingdom, guys, again, remember what I said a couple weeks ago, grace has been reduced again to this thing of what Christ did for me on the cross, and now I've received that favor, so by his grace I'm saved through faith. And we quote that verse, which is absolutely true. But do you know that word has so much more of a meaning once we come into his kingdom, that his grace empowers us. His grace then teaches us the ways of God and shows us, Guys, is this the only kingdom? Is there another kingdom? Are th- is there another age that is to come? Is there something that we're hoping for and longing for? And do you know in the context of that, the word grace is actually used a lot? So we'll look at that. In Ephesians 4, 7 through 8, it says, But each one of us 
Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a captive, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to? Are you mankind? Anthropos. Anthropos. Are you mankind? Okay. So did God give gifts to us? Okay. And by the power, as we know, of the Holy Spirit, yeah, do we have what we call the gifts of the Spirit? According to what? His favor. His grace. All right? And this is where we have to remember who's the one who gave them out. Who portioned them out? We go to Corinthians right now. And Paul is very clear on this. Who portions them out? The Holy Spirit. God himself. All right? So if I get a gift and Aaron gets a gift and Isaac and Trish, and we all get different gifts, who gave them to us? According to what? The grace that was given us. His favor. Because the reality is, guys, mankind all throughout history... Have we been good or evil? Evil, right? The Lord says it, okay? And then God, when he ascended on high, did he give a grace to mankind and give them gifts? Do we deserve the gifts? No, you know what mankind actually deserves, guys? Death, judgment. But God, through his favor, through his son, did he send him and extend a greater grace to mankind? Did he then, while he ascended on high, even give a greater grace and give gifts to mankind? So if you have been given a gift by your father, do you think it's important? Yeah. Okay, I think so. Now, we're not talking in natural terms here. I'm talking in heavenly spiritual terms. If my heavenly father gives me a gift, is there a purpose for it? Yeah. God does not give us gifts for no reason, guys. Okay? And to each one of us, we are given different gifts. So let's say somebody's very evangelistic. Why did God give them that gift? Come on, what's to what? To preach, to go out and what? Help the Lord and tell people about Jesus. Oh, absolutely. Okay, and call them to repentance and call them to the knowledge of the living God. And guys, do we need evangelists? Do we what? Absolutely, Jim. Okay. Has he given teaching? Okay. Has he given prophecy? Okay, now we always look at the big ones, don't we? Has he given gifts of service? Helps. Okay, there are many different things the scriptures have to say about this. And the reality is, are they all needed? What does the Lord say through Paul about the body? He says it in Romans and he says it in Corinthians. Each one, he's given a measure to each one. And each one, if I said to Rachel, well, Rachel's a hand. Oh, I'm only a foot. I want to be a hand. <laughs> does it make me any less of a foot? I'm still a foot. And did God make me a foot? <laughs> Bear with the analogy. All right, come on, guys. Can we call out the prophetic movement? You know why the prophetic movement got weird? Because yeah. everyone wants to be a prophet. Yeah. Because prophets get all the attention. Everyone wants to get a word from God. Now, am I for prophecy? And do I prophesy? And does my wife prophesy? Absolutely. Because Paul, everyone always wants to get on the gifts of tongues, don't they? But do you know what Paul actually said? He said he desires that everyone would Prophet. prophesy. Because tongues edifies myself, unless there's interpretation. But prophecy, who can edify? The whole body, the unbeliever, the person. Okay? And it's a sign that God is in this place. So the reality is, if God has given those giftings, he has a purpose and a plan for it. But then do I need to covet the other giftings? Do I need to desire them? Absolutely. Not covet. Covet is not the right one. Because if I covet and I say, Rachel has it, I want it. Then can I become Balaam? Then can I become Simon the Sorcerer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But can I eagerly desire the greater gifts? Can I see something at work in somebody and can I ask the Lord for it? But then does the Lord have the right to say no? <laughs> Do you know some people aren't called to be teachers and is that okay? Is that okay, guys? Now, should we all be able to teach to a degree? Should you be able to tell your testimony and give a gospel presentation? Should you know the scriptures and be able to talk to your friends and family about Jesus? But does that mean you're going to get up here from the pulpit or you're going to be leading a Bible school and teaching intently? That might not be your gifting. And is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. But could you be like at Bible school? We have people who help another. Trisha always brings us the sandwiches. <laughs> and is that a blessing? Who enjoys the sandwiches? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and is that a blessing? Is that a gifting from God? A gift of service, hospitality, okay, operating in Trisha. So in that, we see that God portions as he desires, but then has he given to them to us, excuse me, for a purpose. 
That grace, that favor that he gave to us. Do you know the Lord is the master banker? Bear with me in the analogy. He invests. And when somebody invests, what do you expect? A return. Do you invest without purpose? Remember the parable the Lord gave us? Your man, five, received five back, two, two back. Your man with one, what did he do with it? He buried it and he judged God because he did not know God. And what happened? Even what he had was taken away from him because did the master receive any investment back from it? Nothing. So if the Lord has given us a gifting, what is the purpose for it? A return to who? The master. To bring glory to his name. So if we're using our spiritual gifting to bring glory to our name, guess what we're going to get a return of? <laughs> what are we going to get a return of? Pride. Selfish ambition. We'll get a return of sin. And we'll actually start to produce bad fruit. So the giftings that God has given us are to bring glory to his name. So Paul, what does Paul say in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10? He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason to keep me from exalting myself. So Paul goes on, tells us the story. I know a man. <laughs> and guess who the man was? It was Paul. He's being, I like Paul because, come on, uh, Michael likes Paul as well. You meet him. And as New Yorkers, you know what we are? We're very sarcastic. If you've ever been to New York, you'll notice that New Yorkers like to be sarcastic. And we'll joke with one another. And you have to do it in love and not with everybody. Have wisdom in that. But many times, you know, Paul was very sarcastic. Oh, if I go on boasting about myself and then he goes into, he says, I'll go into a bit of foolishness. But he's being very sarcastic. He's getting a point across. And he tells the story and he says, you know what? Well, I know a man. But who was it? It was himself. And because of what he's seen, what does it say? The Lord gave him. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Can we theologically wrap our head around that one? But can you agree with it? Can you accept it? You have to. That's the point. Absolutely. And who did this? God did. So can you accept that theologically? You have to. Because Paul did. Because over and over again throughout the scriptures, we see it over and over again. Like the story of Ahab, when the Lord says... Well, who will go and put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of the false prophets? I will. I'll do it. Here's how I'll do it. So we have to make sure these things we take by faith, knowing God is sovereign over all. And what was the reason he was given this? A messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from what? Exalting myself. So really quick, I've said it before. If you are on to one of these ministries that keeps saying, I go to heaven every day, I'm going to tell you right now, it's rubbish. Okay? Because Paul himself, did he go to heaven? He did. He did. And did he receive a surpassing revelation? And what happened to him? He got a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. Someone that says they're going to heaven every day, it's absolute rubbish, guys. There is still a division. Okay? Now, one day, will we go there? Come on, will we go there, guys, if we hold fast? Will we go to heaven and will we be on earth? And in the millennial reign, in the day of the Lord, does it seem like we'll be going in between? It seems like it. This is an amazing thing, okay? But in that, the Lord did this to keep him humble. So do we need to remain humble, guys? The gift that God has given us by his favor, do we use it then? Could Paul have gone around like all these ministries now and could he have been like, I went to heaven and this is what God showed me because I, could he have done that? And you know what? There's a lot of ministries doing that now and I'll tell you, be very careful of that. He says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times. So can we ask the Lord? Uh -huh. Okay. So he asked him that it might leave me. And he said to me, no. That's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no. Can you fit that in your theological uh, doctrinal bubble? Are you okay with that? Can the Lord say no? Yeah. He's God. So he says no. And what is the answer that he gives? My grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in weakness so when we go through now paul i don't think any of us are on the paul level okay let's be honest but the reality is can we go through hardship can we go through tribulation and in that time what is the lord teaching us his favor is it sufficient for us that if they did come and take away our houses would it, his grace be sufficient for us in that moment would we actually rejoice and would we say, Lord, this is for your glory? 
Guys, over and over again, when did the name of Jesus go out all throughout the scriptures? When they went to prison. When they were persecuted. When they were martyred. Do you know what happened? Boom! The gospel explodes. Do you know that's what's happening right now in China? Yeah, absolutely. All these places. It doesn't explode that way here. Why? Because we're too comfortable. Because we've got all our stuff. Go home and read Revelation 3. Church of Laodicea. That is the Western world. So it continues on. He said, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell within me. What did Jesus say when we go through persecutions, when they say all types of evil things about you, when they do this and that and the other? Rejoice! Thank you, Lord! That new song that we sung, that was something the Lord put on my heart because we need to get back to that point no matter what. Lord, you give and take away. Lord, will we indeed accept good but not adversity? I will say, blessed be your name. That no matter what, is he still good, guys? Is God still on the throne? Absolutely. Job. Oh, that's an amazing prophetic word from Job. He says, I know my Redeemer will, at the last, very prophetic, take his stand on the... And guys, if we keep that in mind, no matter what happens, will God's grace be sufficient for us? And will we know that my God will again take his stand on this earth? And his kingdom will come. And all the darkness, all the wickedness, all the death and pain will be dealt with. All right? We need to keep that in mind. So then what does Paul say? Therefore, I am content with my weaknesses. Paul's content with a thorn in the flesh. Think about that for a moment. With insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For what? For Christ's sake. So when all this stuff happens, what do we always have to remember? It's for? It's for his sake. It's for his glory. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Everyone always quote that verse. There's the context of the verse. All right? We need to know it. So we can very easily be this little girl, couldn't we? Given out, whining and moaning and crying. All right? And we need to make sure, myself included, that we renew our outlook. That we say his grace is sufficient for us. And can we say such bold things as they said? In Acts 5, 41, it says, they took his advice. And after calling the apostles, this is after the Lord uh, sent them to, they were arrested. Uh, Rabbi Gimiel gives counsel, says, let them go, because if this is the will of God, we won't be able to stop it, basically. Yeah. And they flogged them. So what happened? Do you know what a flogging is, guys? Has anyone in this room ever been flogged? I can tell you right now, no. I know you. We haven't. Okay? They got beat. They got beat and bled. And do you know Paul? Remember when Paul says, I bear the marks of Christ? Do you know what he was literally talking about? He was saying his body was marked for Christ. He was beaten for Christ. Okay? He says then, I, uh, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they say, all right, get out of here, right? So they went on their way from the presence of the council. And what were they doing? Oh! I am a citizen of heaven. I did not deserve that. Isn't that how the church reacts nowadays? That shouldn't have happened to me. But they go, and what do they say? They went away from the presence of the council. What does it say? Rejoicing that they had been considered, this is an amazing statement, worthy to suffer shame for his name. Would we have the same response? We need to prepare ourselves, guys. I'm not saying we're all going to get flogged, okay? But when tribulation, when hardship, when persecution comes, will we boldly praise God in the midst of it? Will we exalt his name and be a light in the midst of the darkness for Christ? Or will we go along to get along? And in every day, what does it say? That in the temple and, the, and the house, uh, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching. The message was not going to be stopped. It didn't matter what the enemy did. didn't matter what the government or anyone else did. They came and said, you know what? This is the gospel. And the world needs to hear it. Do you carry the gospel within you? Have you received new life? And have you received resurrection life? That you will go out and tell people about the good news. The grace that has been given to you. James 2. So remember what I said? God's grace. It's producing something with us, isn't it? He gives us. Obviously gifting. He gives us a greater measure uh, of the Spirit as we grow in Him. And then as we do that, what starts to happen? We start to produce fruit. All right? Good works. Good deeds. 
All right, now we are not saved by deeds. Remember, guys? Remember what Paul said in Ephesians? We are saved by grace through faith so that no man may boast. I saved myself. I did enough good deeds. I am righteous. All right, and has that always been the deception throughout the world? It has, guys. Jew, Gentile, that has always been the deception. And I'm telling you right now, can any of us struggle with that deception? Yeah. Well, you know what? I did a good thing this week, so I'm grand. So? <laughs> we can all do good works, but if those good works don't lead to Jesus, they're just meaningless works. They're actually, the scriptures say, dead works. Okay? All right. Could I go... What would you say? Uh, they can be, absolutely. Can I go run a million marathons in Dublin for every charity under the sun? Can I? Maybe no. <laughs> but could I, hypothetically, bear with the hypothetical here. You could sign up for him. I could sign up for him. No, if I went out there and I started to do all this exercise, all for charity, all this stuff, and I said, I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to do this for this thing and that thing and the other thing. I could, couldn't I? Mm -hmm. Is it worth it? Okay, let's say, say 50 in the year, okay, hypothetically, right? Every weekend I go and do it. What's the point? Is there any point? There is no point. Is there any point for, for going and unfortunately in a Christian church, it's a form of dominionism that has come in. We think if we go and we stand up for this cause, this thing, that other, that we will then change it. We can't change it. Guys, you can't. All right? I come from America. Do you know what has been a foregone conclusion since the 70s in America? Abortion. Absolutely heartbreaking, isn't it? Okay? Something that uh, grieves the heart of God. Sacrifice of children at the end of the day. And, you know, since the 70s, guess what Christians have been trying to do? Change it. Has it changed? No. Why hasn't it changed? People don't want to change. People are evil. So when it comes to social activities, when it comes to things that are injustice and wrong, guess what, guys? There is only one who can change it, and his name is Jesus. And if we don't bring Jesus into the situation, we are wasting our time, and it is a fool's errand. And the only way all these things will be solved is when Christ comes. Okay? It doesn't matter what it is. We can't fix it, guys, because the point is we're supposed to get to that point and realize, I can't fix it. Only he can fix it. He will not come again to this earth until they say what? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, because he is the one who will fix it. James 2, so what's the point? What use is it, my brother, and if someone says to me, he has faith, but has no works? Can that faith save him? Can it save him? If a brother or a sister without clothing is in need of daily food, and one of you says, ah, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, right? And yet, you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Very quickly, who did he say? A brother. What's a brother? Someone of the faith. This is not a verse we will take and then use for feeding the homeless. Do we need to care for the homeless? Did Jesus say we will always have them? Yeah, the poor will always be among you, okay? So is there time for that? But when I go to the homeless, do I need to bring a gospel message as well? Can I give them food? Can I give them clothing? But do I need to teach them about Jesus? Because if I give them food for their belly and then walk away, that food is gone within a couple hours, isn't it? But if I don't give them living food, it is, again, a fool's errand. So in that, what is he saying here? Well, if you see your brother in need, so of the household of the faith, if I see Jim come in and he just got robbed outside and he's bleeding, he's got no coat, and I say, good to see you, Jim. How's everything going? And then he stays the whole church and none of us help him. We say, see you later, Jim. See you next Tuesday. Do we have a problem? We do, don't we? Because could I be looking at my nice new coat and say... Oh, I just got that new coat. I don't want to give it to him. <laughs> and could I say, well, I have need of that, and I don't want to give it to him. Could that very easily come into my heart? Something silly, right? But the reality is we are to care for one another, and by caring for one another, what happens? Does our faith get put into practice? Do we actually see it? Yeah. Right? Faith, guys, isn't a silent thing. Has anyone noticed this? What does the Lord say about our faith? We're to proclaim it. We're to go out and say it. We're to go out and do it. We're not supposed to hide it away. We're not supposed to put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? <laughs> so then he continues on. Even so, faith, okay, uh, 
if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say to you, I have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you faith by my works. What does Jesus want us to produce? Fruit. What is fruit? Fruit is evidence that there is growth, isn't there? If you plant a vineyard and you put all the vines in, you go through all the work, why did you do that? That you might produce fruit. And one day, obviously, turn it into wine or whatever it may be. Make something from the fruit. So in that, what does the Lord say about the ones who do not bear fruit? Yeah, we got a bunch of scriptures on those, don't we? Okay, yeah. That that thing is supposed to then well up within us. And if I have faith, what starts to happen? Works start to accompany it. Are we saved by the works? No. But they are they an evidence, excuse me, of our faith. And if someone says they have faith, but there's no works, guess what? Their faith needs to come up, doesn't it? Yeah, or they're cold, or they've backslidden, as we'd say, okay? So it says here, now there's some, well, there's, man, James is one of the hardest books and says some really tough things, right? He says here, you believe that God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, okay? So do you believe that in this place today? If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. Do you guys know that? If you don't believe that, you can't be a Christian. Yeah, absolutely. You're denying the Godhead. And if you deny the Godhead, you cannot be what we call a Christian, a, a little anointed one, follower of Christ. So you believe God is one. You do well. So do we do well today? Okay, good. The demons also believe and shudder. That's kind of like a little whack. <laughs> oh, you believe God is one. Good. All right, like uh, I always like to say, you know what? Believing God is real. Guess what that is? Common sense. That's not faith. That's common sense. That when you go out that door and you see all creation and you see everything spinning around and all th that's common sense. There is a God. There is a creator. Do you know what faith is? Faith is then saying, I believe he created all those things. Now I choose to walk in his ways. Now I choose to bow my knee to the Lord of heaven and follow his commands and walk in his principles. That is faith, guys. Faith is when the trial comes and when we don't understand, we say, God, I trust you. God, I choose you. Faith is Job. When all that happened to Job, and what does he get up and say? Blessed be your name. Faith is David. When David lost a child, and what did he do? Amen. He got up and worshipped. The list is endless. I could keep going on there. So he continues on. He says, but you are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, the faith without works is useless. But now Abraham, our father, justified by uh, works when he offered up sacrifice, uh, offered, excuse me, offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of his works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as... So how have we always been saved? I've got to drill this in because we have to get it out of our head. How has everyone always been saved all throughout human history? Through faith. Through faith. And through grace. That's right. Very good. All throughout history, nothing has changed. The sacrifice changed. The requirement changed. But God's eternal qualities and system, what has it always been? By faith through his grace. The old covenant, was it set up on the same way, guys? It was, guys. Do you know what it was? By faith, was Abraham saved? He was. Then was it reckoned to him as righteousness? Okay? So it continues on. And he was called, this is beautiful, the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, you uh, was also Rahab, not, uh, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is? What happens when our spirit leaves our body? So if we say we are Christians, but there is no works or deeds that accompany it, fruit that comes about, what are we? Spiritually dead. Okay? The Lord says that we are to produce fruit, are we not? And he says, absolutely, the fruit of the Spirit. What's one of the fruit of the Spirit? Come on, everybody name them. Love, joy, kindness. That's a good one, yes. We could go through, we can name them all, right? 
Faithfulness. Faithfulness is actually one of the fruits of the Spirit. Are we faithful to God? Is he faithful to us, guys? Well, it is a trustworthy statement, Paul says to Timothy. He says, even if we deny God, right, and go through all that, he says, God is still faithful. Even if we are faithless, he is still Think about that for a moment. And have we seen that all throughout the ages, God? That's our, that's our guide. So it's an amazing thing. But one of the fruits of the Spirit is it faithfulness, guys. Are we being faithful to God? Are we walking in His commands? And guys, you know what? You will have to give an account for that. Each and every one of us will we stand before the Lord. Okay? And will He either say, well done, good and faithful servant, and will he gird himself? Will he wait on us? Will he give us reward and bless us based on what we've done in this age? But is there also, like we read before, unfortunately, those who will trample the cross, who will insult the spirit of grace? And do we want to make sure, by no means will I be in that camp, that will I, I will stay faithful to the Lord. And as I walk by the Holy Spirit, his faithfulness will be produced in my life. All right, we've got 15 minutes, so we're going to continue on. So we're jumping over to Luke, Jesus, okay? I'm just going to use, this is kind of uh, in Luke 12 here, we have like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, right? And here we get some of the same teaching, and then it's other teaching as well. So we'll pick it up at Luke 12, verse 13. And the Lord speaking here says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Because he was a Dominion theology guy. <laughs> But he said to him, some of you get that joke, uh, said to him, man, who appointed me judge and arbiter over you? A day will come when Jesus will do that. Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. So do we all need to remember that? We do. And he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man was very productive. Is that a good thing? Yeah. Who made it productive? God, very good, absolutely. And he began reasoning, excuse me, to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store up my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And, that, uh, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. Is there anything wrong in this actually? There's nothing wrong in that, is there? No, okay. Can we have a good business? Okay, can we be blessed from God? Okay. <laughs> I'll be quiet. I'm going to get in trouble. Keep going. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for you for years to come. Take, ease, eat, and drink, and be merry. Okay? So the hard attitude. But God said to him, you... All right. When the Lord says you fool, very serious. Okay? He says you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now... Who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not to rich towards. That's the problem, isn't it? Okay, so can the Lord bless us? Then, ben, excuse me, by his grace, by his favor, by his faith, by faith, excuse me, working within us, then is there a requirement? Is there an action on our part? What was the problem in this parable? Your man, he gets it all stored up, all stored up, all stored up. What was he supposed to do with some of that? Give it to the Lord. Now, audience is important. Context is important. Who's Jesus talking to? Jews. Do the Jews know the Lord's way of tithing, especially when it came to an agricultural society? Do the Jews know what the Lord says about all the different times throughout the year they are to bring it in? Yes. Okay? So this man, not only once, many times he decided, I will not give to God. Because what had gotten to his heart? Greed, covetousness, all different types of things, right? And he says, well, I'll keep it for myself. So his faith was useless, wasn't it? There was no works accompanied by it. Now, again, I'm just using the analogy. And the point is we need to make sure that we are giving from that place because we have received all from God's hand. In Zechariah, it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. All right, this is the amazing thing. It's not by our might. It's not by our power. But what is it? It's by his Holy Spirit. What did God say he would do if we are true new covenant, right? We like that term, new covenant Christians. Where would he write his law? 
on our hearts and on our minds. Well, if we have truly received this new covenant, is his law written on your heart and on your mind? Do you abide in it? Do you walk in it? It's a good test for us all, guys. Does it mean that when we read the scriptures, can some things be challenging? Can a lot of things be challenging? <laughs> can the Lord cut us to the quick, as the old King James said? He can. And do we need to allow it to then work within us mightily, and we submit to his commands? All right, so Jesus continues on, and for the sake of time, you know the next part. The next part's all about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. And Joan talked about faith today. And he says, if, well, if the birds, right, if the grass, if the lilies, if they're all taken care of, guess who else God is going to care for? Everyone point at yourself. Me. <laughs> He's going to take care of me. Because if I believe in him and trust in him and I walk in his commands, who is he? We have the right to become children of the living God. In the natural, does a father take care of his children? Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, how much more so? You being evil, and you give good gifts to your children. How much more will the, the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Okay? So the Lord, will he take care of us, guys? And by that, are we exercising our faith? Saying, God, you are good, and I know you will provide. Jesus, in both accounts, did he rebuke them and say, you, little, you of little faith? He did. He said, don't worry about these things. And then he continues on, and this is the context. He says, for all these things, the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your father knows that you have need of these things. That's comforting. But seek first, here's the requirement, his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. All right, in Matthew it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? And all these things will be added unto you. Do not be afraid, little flock. Is this very intimate language, guys? It is, isn't it? Your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Bad translation, I will say. Give alms is actually the proper translation. Charity means something to us, doesn't it? I'm going to rant a little bit here. What does charity mean for us? Charity means like the charity shops, doesn't it? Yeah, foundation for lupus, foundation for cancer. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Okay? He is talking about giving alms. Who were alms given to? The poor and the needy and those who were in service and who needed those things. Okay? The orphan, the widow. And do you know all throughout Scripture how those alms were then given out? It was never through the person's own giving. It was actually through the temple. And then in the first century church, it was through the apostles. And I'll give a little rant right here. Do you want to know why the Lord has done it this way? Let's say somebody comes down the stairs. They're homeless. Do we want to help them? Yeah. If we can. Yeah. They come down. They genuinely want to seek the Lord and know Jesus. Yeah. We start to get their story and we say, yes, we will help you. And we see that there's a genuine need there. Are there others that will come down and they're trying to scam the church out of money? Yeah. It's truth. Okay. Do we still love the person? Yeah. Do we still tell them about Jesus? Yeah. Do we kick him out the door and say, you no good sinner? No, of course not. We still tell them about Jesus, but do I need to have wisdom and say, nope, that person is looking for a free meal, free handout, right? And the reality is most people, unfortunately, who are coming into those situations, what do they usually have? An addiction problem. It's just the reality of it, isn't it? There's sin, okay? And if I then felt so inclined, I'll give them a tenor because I feel bad for them. What could happen with that tenor? Drugs, alcohol, sin. So why did God then say it needs to go through the temple or through the apostles, the church? Be the church absolutely is supposed to have discernment, isn't it? And leaders, maybe your man's a homeless guy who comes down and you Trish is the first time. Sorry, picking on you. She wants to go to him and give him something really nice, right? But then I go to Trish and I say, Trish, no, don't do that because I know the guy. He's been living in the town for two months and every time I see him, he's blackout drunk. So am I going to give him money? But if he didn't have a coat and he was freezing, could I say, you know what, here's a coat. And do you know what most of them will actually do? I don't want that. Because it's not what they want. And it's a testimony to what's in the heart. Does it mean you don't love them? No. What did, what did uh, Peter do? Silver and gold I do not have, but my gift to you. And what did he have? The power of the living God. Do we have the power of the living God dwelling within us? And your man, what did he say? Arise and walk. Did Peter force him to walk? He helped him up, but your man had faith. And you want, you want to know why he had faith? He was sitting outside the temple gates. Yeah, he heard the word, and he got up, and he said, all right, I'm going to get up. 
And did he do it? And by faith, did he start leaping and jumping and praising God and walking into the temple? He did. So we need to have wisdom. So alms, uh, sorry, charity, guys, is not charitable organizations. Bad translation in our Bibles. It's actually alms in the Hebrews. Yes, on that topic, if anybody wants to give in those areas, we do have charitable funds here at the church. There are people in need. There are situations like that. And you could always just put on an envelope alms or you could put uh, donation towards whatever you want to phrase it as. The point is there is a need for these things in the household of God. All right, so the Lord says, right, your treasure is in heaven. Okay, so he continues on here. Where were we? Sell your possessions, give to alms, make yourselves money belts, which you do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near, nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so what has a hold of our heart, guys? Do, do we need to examine that? And I like to say, you know what, where your time is, there your treasure is also. Because what you're spending time on, that's what you truly love. Yeah. All right? And do we all have to examine that? All right? So if I love my wife, will I spend time with her? <laughs> I better. That's right. And if I started to fall out of love with her, would I be spending time with her? All right. Well, when it comes to the Lord, if we love the Lord, what will we be doing? Spending time with him. Abiding with him. Yeah, absolutely. In our household right? Personally, in our secret place with the Lord, we'll be waking up, we'll be praying, we'll be worshiping, we'll be seeking Him daily, but then also in the household of God. We'll constantly be coming together. That's where we will see what really matters in our lives. So the Lord continues on. We'll finish out with Luke 12 here. And in Luke 12, He says, be dressed in readiness. This is the same context. This is just the next verse. And keep your lamps lit. All right? He doesn't want our lamps to go out. Why do you need a lamp? To give light, because what's around? Darkness. Well, guys, are we surrounded by darkness? Okay? Is Christ winning? He's already won, past tense. Okay? But right now, has he allowed the enemy and an evil age, so to speak, to exist for a time? And do we know there is a man called the Antichrist coming? Okay, and he says the darkness will increase, but the light will also, okay, and the true light will shine bright. He says, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself, this is an amazing word, to serve and to have them recline at the table, and they will come up and wait on them. Who's saying this? Jesus. So what is Jesus saying? The wise servant, the one who loves him and is longing for his coming and watching for him and welcomes him when he comes, what is Jesus going to do? He's going to serve them. Guys, let that sink in for a moment. The creator of the universe, the God over all, he is going to serve us. He's going to serve his creation. Do you remember any times in history where you see kings and rulers and emperors serving the common folk? <laughs> yeah, exactly. let them eat cake, yeah. <laughs> Marie Antoinette, right? Rebellion. We never see it, do we? We always see the opposite. They lord it over. Now, is he the lord? And do we need to submit to him in such fashion? But will he also gird himself and does he call us friends? Does he call us sons? Does he have such intimate language for us? We read it before just a minute ago. My flock. That's intimate, isn't it? So he will serve them, right? And it says, whether he comes in the second watch or even the third, and he finds them so, blessed are those slaves. Okay? But be sure of this. If the head of the house had known at the hour the thief was coming, he would have, uh, well, sorry, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready for the Son of Man is coming an hour you do not expect him. All right? Because the prophecies are clear. The world is going to be say, saying, excuse me, peace and safety. Peace, peace. Go read Jeremiah, guys. Very prophetic. The same thing that happened in the time of Jeremiah is going to happen to the entire world. False prophets will come and say, peace, peace. But the reality is at the end of the age, what did the Lord say? He said there will be wars and rumors of wars. He said there will be calamity. He said, the, every, what did we just read in Hebrews? Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. All right? That's the truth. So he continues on, and he says, Peter says, Lord, 
Are you addressing this parable? And I remember they asked this a bunch of times. Are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward, whom the master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom the master finds so doing when he comes. Now, I think there's a, a charge here specifically to leaders as well, the steward, okay? Blessed is the slave whom the master finds when, he's, when he comes, sorry. Um, truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of, think about this for a moment, all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time coming. And guys, do you know right now the major heresy that is sweeping through the church? Literally, word for word, that line. Jesus isn't coming for a long time. The master's not coming. And guys, I'm going to tell you, you know what? Jesus is at the door. He's coming soon. But if Jesus still was not coming for, let's say, a time period, what is our heart attitude supposed to be? We're supposed to be ready at any moment that we can meet him. That any moment he is going to, what? Walk through that door. Now, there are things that need to happen prophetically. The Lord has told us. But we need to be, what does it say? Be dressed in are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, guys. Are you ready? I hope you're ready. All right? And we need to be in that place 24-7, dressed in readiness with our lamps lit. And he says, Blessed is the man whom the master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, My master will be a long time coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on that day when he does not expect him, and an hour when he does not know, and will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Now this is a very scary verse. Why is this a very scary verse? He's not talking about unbelievers. He's not talking about the world. Who is he talking about? Christians, the church. He's saying that there are people in the household of God who have turned the grace of God, what? Into a license to sin. They begin to abuse their fellow brethren. They begin to be drunk and sin and do all the things that they know they ought not do. And what happens? They don't know the day that he's coming. Now, if we jumped over to Matthew 25, guess what, guys? On the flip side, the one who is looking, guess what? They know the day that he's coming. They know and they see the day approaching. They know that the master, what does it say? Blessed is the man who's dressed in readiness, right? And his lant lip. So when the master comes, he, it says he immediately opens the door. If he didn't know his master was coming, how could he immediately open the door? He would be outside in the field, wouldn't he? He'd be doing some work. And of course, we still do the work while we're here. But he's right at the door because he knows the sign is here. The time has come. My master said he's coming. Welcome, master. And that's the way we are supposed to be. I'm almost done here. He says, and the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many lashes. So there's different groups, guys. There's people in the church who have taken God's grace and they've said, now it's an excuse for me to sin and do whatever I want. There's a group in the church, unfortunately, that says, okay, well, you know what? I know my master's will. Who here has read the scriptures? If you come to this church, we're constantly reading the scriptures, okay? And do you read them at home? I hope so. Have you gone through Bible school? Do you faithfully read the word? I hope so. So have you heard it? Okay? Now, are you required to have an action from that? It's not enough just to hear it. Jesus said the foolish man was the one who heard it and did nothing. The wise man was the one who heard it and then put it into practice. Faith produces action. And then he, what? Built his rock. Sorry, built his house upon the rock. And he had the firm foundation in Christ Jesus. All right? So, but the one who didn't, he's a fool. And what? He can receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging, he will receive but few. What are we seeing here? Are we seeing grace, guys? Is that grace? That's mercy and grace, isn't it? Because he goes through and there are some who do not know. There are some who have not received the level of teaching that other Christians have. And God will show them favor. James, he says... By what we know, right, we will be judged. That if we know something is sin and we continue to do it, then it is sin. But if I didn't know something was sin and I was doing it, does God show me grace? He does. Unmerited favor. He does not hold that trespass against me. But as soon as, boom, the light bulb goes on and I know that's sin, what happens? The wages of sin is death. Death starts to come in. And then we have a choice, don't we? 
If I know it's sin, now I need to turn away from it. I need to repent. And if we continue in that sin, then we can trample the cross of Christ. We're ending with this thought. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Have we received much from our God, guys? If you have walked with the Lord and started to know his grace, his favor, what he has poured out upon us is the requirement from us. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we have to remember that. That the Lord has given us that favor that we would go out and produce good fruit. You are not saved by the good fruit. You're not saved by the work. But it's an evidence of his grace through faith dwelling within you. And then we go out and what do we do? We do the works of the kingdom. Let's stand up. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. You are so good to us, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you have poured out upon your people grace, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, again for your atoning sacrifice, that you willingly laid down your life for us, Lord. And Jesus, we just ask again this day that we would not take that for granted. Lord, that that would not be commonplace in our lives. And even the places that we've come from, Lord, we thank you that by your saving grace, you have redeemed us, you have rescued us, you have delivered us literally, Lord, from death. So, Lord, we thank you for that, and may we never take that for granted. May it never be something that we just go on and say, oh, yeah, I'm I'm a sinner saved by grace. Uh, No, Lord, may we take it to heart. May we walk in your grace, and may it produce within us, Lord, a great faith that we would trust you, Lord Jesus, that we would walk in your commands, that we would love you, the Lord our God, with all of our heart. And we thank you, Lord, from that place for the good works, the deeds, Lord, the fruit that will come, not for our benefit, but for yours, Christ Jesus. We thank you that as we walk in your commands, Lord, that we will bring glory to your name. And we just ask in this place, Lord, that our faith would rise. Lord, the stories that we read today, that as they went out, Lord, and they were even beaten, they went out rejoicing saying, Lord, thank you so much that we were counted worthy to suffer for your kingdom. So, Lord, may that be our mindset, that we, through all things, would praise you, that we would say thank you, that we would exalt your name, knowing the mighty deed that you were doing in us and through us. And we thank you, God, That you say, as we submit to your plans, the work that you begin within each one of us, you will complete. So we thank you, Lord, for that completed work. And we thank you, Jesus, for your mighty work in each one of us. Amen.